I'll see you guys in the dark. I'm a 26-year-old woman who has lived in Alaska my whole life. This will become important later when you see just how far this person would go to try and be with me. This all happened a few years back when I was in college. Like any woman at that age, I made a grave mistake of attempting online dating to disastrous consequences. I was using OkCupid to try and find a potential partner, but I also had it listed in my bio that I was looking for friends. One day this girl, we'll call her Jen, messages me. She seemed nice, and we got to talking, and really hit it off, but I made it clear that at the time I wasn't looking for a relationship due to being preoccupied with work and school. I should preface the rest of the story by saying that I like to help people, and it's really hard for me not to. Honestly, it's been the biggest flaw that I've had over the years. It was a contributing factor in multiple abusive relationships I've been in before, and since this incident. Anyway, the result of this has been that I tend to drain myself to try and help others, and it attracts unsavory and unstable people. We started going into conversations about our various interests, and eventually we stumbled across gaming as a mutual one. Jen suggested that we play this new game, Ark Survival Evolved. Cursed ruin of a game that wasn't very well optimized for any system. To be honest, it was an absolute dumpster fire of a game, but at the time I thought a lot of potential. So I spent countless hours making various bases and trading dinosaurs, getting to the whole bit of brave explorer of a new world kind of thing. Jen and I spent a lot of time in the multiplayer building things, in training dinos, talking, and having a good time. During this time, she opened up to me about a lot of the abuse that she had suffered from the past relationships, and from a family that didn't accept her being gay. Having also been through some difficult times, I felt a lot of empathy for her, and would try to build her up, talk her out of her self-hating, especially when I had the energy to. This is when the trouble started, though. I had noticed that she was being a bit too friendly with me, and kept being overtly sexual and flirty for a week or two. It started with endgame RP kind of stuff, where you do the asterisk kisses and hugs. It was all just too much. She was really nice and all, but totally not my type. I had addressed the situation multiple times, saying that it had made me feel very uncomfortable. But every time we had that conversation, Jin would tell me that she understood, and would back off, etc., you know, the drill. It just never got through to her. This time, we had started having communications on a chat app called Telegram. I wasn't always on my computer, so it seemed like a convenient solution. I've started noticing that a lot of the emojis she was using displayed a very similar lack of respect for my boundaries. Just as before, I had mentioned to Jen that it made me uncomfortable. I knew she had a lot going on upstairs, but me being me, I have always been a very gentle soul. It's always been very difficult to set firm boundaries, and to keep those especially when someone is suffering. One weekend was very packed with homework, and a double shift at work. I ended up getting home very late. I booted up the computer just to check some emails as I ate my dinner of top ramen before zonking out. When Steam loaded up, I noticed that I had hundreds of missed messages and comments, all from Jen. started from the top, and as I read through things, became more progressive, and more out of control. By the time I was halfway through, every other email was either calling me names or threatening to end herself if I didn't reply. I had seen enough, so I just sent a message saying that her behavior was unacceptable, but I can't be friends with someone who is going to be abusive like this. I blocked her on Steam and on Telegram. This is when shit really hit the fan. About 30 minutes later, my phone starts going off. Mind you, this is about 12.30 a.m., so that would make it about 3 a.m. for her. She called my cell number with what she had saved from the telegram. She was absolutely out of control. From that moment, I picked up the phone. She was screaming obscenities and slurring at me, first with confessions of love and desperate pleas for me to unblock her so we could just be friends again, and that she would make it up to me and all that crap. I tried to explain her to her what she had done was out of line, and that I just didn't have the emotional capacity to go through another abusive friendship, but she was having absolutely none of it. I did the only thing that I could do. I ended the call and blocked the number. 
Five minutes later, I get a call from an unrecognized private number, and I pick it up. Knowing exactly what I was in for, it was her again, calling from her parents' landline. I immediately hung up. Fifteen seconds go by, and my phone rings again. I dismissed the call. My phone rang again about five minutes later with the same number. This goes on for a solid fifteen minutes before I just turned my phone off and went to bed. It was a fairly sleepless night, but thankfully the next day I had class in the evening, so I had the opportunity to sleep in. I woke up from an okay sleep, turned on my phone to find over a hundred missed calls, and about as many voicemails. I checked my telegram to talk to a different friend about the chaos that was going on, to find new messages from six new accounts. Most of them were just walls of text filled with the same amount of uncontrolled ramblings that she had said on the phone. They were the text of someone who had completely lost it, all over the place in tone and message, switching back and forth between I love you and insert slurs here, with little regard of spacing, punctuation, capitalization, or general legibility. I was horrified. I mean, I had seen my fair share of breakdowns, but never ones that impacted me directly. Then I get a phone call. Same unknown private number. Hoping she had calmed down enough to listen to reason, I picked up. She started sobbing, screaming unintelligibly at me, starting right back in. Mad as hell, I screamed into the phone for her to shut up, and for the first time in what was probably about 14 hours, she did. Very clearly, I told her not to call me again, and that she had gone way over the line, and that I wanted nothing to do with her after this. Calm, monotone that still makes me shudder to this day, she said, What do I do to prove my love for you? Do you want me to end myself? How about my dog? I can end her for you. Honestly, I was so shocked. I just told her no, that if she loved me, she would move on and get some help. This was the worst possible answer. Immediately, she started in again screaming, so I just hung up, turned off my phone. Fuck, I'm shaking again, just remembering this all. She called me back constantly for the rest of the morning until I turned my phone off. The next day, I went in and got my number changed, hoping that would be the end of it. A few days passed, and I'm at work. My boss comes over saying I had a phone call from my mother. I thought nothing of it until I picked up the phone and heard Jen's voice on the other end. She started in talking about how she had been cutting herself, and how she would keep doing it until she was dead if I didn't unblock her. So I hung up the phone without a word. Told my boss not to bother with my phone calls unless it was from a known listed number on my emergency contacts file. With my new phone, I set up Telegram again, and started going through blocking all of her alternative accounts, but that still wasn't the end of it. For about six months after this whole thing went down, Every few weeks, I would get a new telegram contact on a new number, begging me to unblock her so that we could be together. I know it's not some big climactic end, but honestly, what could I do? All I knew of her at the time was that her first name, screen name, and state. If I had reported it to the police, nothing would have been done anyways. The cops here don't take kindly to queer people like myself, so I just didn't want to risk any BS with them. I have more tales of internet fuckery, but this is by far one of the most jarring that I encountered. Sorry if it's not all flared up. It's just the boring truth. Oh, and to Jen, the out-of-control lesbian from Ark Survival Evolved. I hope you've gotten help, but please, never contact me again. So I went to the grocery store to buy some milk and eggs today. I was wearing a cute pair of shorts since it was spring, and I like to show off some skin during the warm summer months. I was hoping to get some attention from some cute boys, but instead I ended up getting attention from someone that I didn't want it from. The guy was about 5'2", chubby, balding, and what hair he did have was extremely greasy. The guy smelled like cheap beer, liquor, and marijuana, and as if he hadn't showered in a couple of months. He had facial hair, except it was patchy and disgusting and only grew under his chin. My friend Haley described him as what you would call a neck beard. I wasn't expecting any interaction with this guy to be for very long. Maybe a polite excuse me, so I could move past him, and that would be the end of it. Oh boy, was I wrong about that. The simple interaction turned into this guy following me through the entire store, and even into the parking lot. 
I honestly thought this guy was going to attack me. It was one of the most terrifying things that I had ever experienced. The guy following me would try and get my attention, and every time I ignored him, he would shout things like, You effing bitch. And I'm a nice guy. Just give me a chance. After he tried to get in my car, I decided enough was enough. I locked the doors, called the police before he could get in. But by the time that the cops got there, the guy was gone. They took my statement and told me that they would call me if they heard anything or found the guy that was following me around. I hadn't heard anything from the cops about that. It wasn't until about a week later when a news story came on TV and I saw this guy's picture on the screen. There was a caption reading, Child Predator, set for trial next week. Multiple human trafficking charges filed. I felt my heart move into my throat. Being only 18 years old, I was terrified of what could have happened to me. After the day I watched the story on TV, I felt not only relief, but also fear at the same time. So, creepy guy that followed me around the store and tried to get into my car. Let's never meet again. My story begins years ago when I was married to my first husband. Well, me and my first husband were going in different directions, but during this time, we were still friends. I did mention to him that it might be best if we just got a divorce. I'm not saying I was an angel because I wasn't. I had a one-night stand with a guy who turned out to be another stalker, but I digress. So, I knew of a group of people from work who loved to party. We were all in our early 30s so why not? At that time, I used to have the biggest crush on this guy, Craig. He was funny and from Boston with this cute little accent. We both worked in D.C. and were federal employees. At this time, too, I lived with a roommate, Dina, and she lived with my husband, Jay, and myself. Although I still loved Jay, me and him grew apart, and he never wanted to spend time with me or my friends. Because of this, I spent a lot of time with friends and co-workers and my infatuation with Craig grew, and I remember one of my co-workers telling me that I had a crush on him. One time, he invited me and my roommate to watch the fireworks in D.C. from his apartment complex in Virginia. We both went, and the entire time, he was trying to grab my butt. It was odd because he acted like he hated me before and loved to humiliate me, but this time it was different, so I just let it go. Fast forward a couple of years. My roommate moved away back to New Mexico, her home state, and I stayed in Virginia and was still living with my husband, but now we no longer had the buffer of the roommate. And it was obvious that we were incompatible. I felt trapped in the marriage, and like a slut, wanted to have another affair. Except the guilt would kill me, so I would get in situations where I was about to leap, but I never did. So one day, I got a text from Craig. Him and the gang were meeting at a local bar, and asked if I wanted to come. I thought it was odd, because after my roommate left, they rarely ever invited me to bars, but I went anyway. When I got there, there were all these people I knew from work there, and I felt comfortable, and Craig asked me to join him. All of us were at the pool table taking turns and drinking. Craig had such a funny way about him, and could make anyone laugh, so that day was no different. He had me rolling on the floor. Little by little, people left until there was only about three couples there, and me and Craig. Craig got a small table and kept buying me drinks. He got behind me and was hugging me and kissing my neck. It felt strange to do this at the bar because all those people knew I was married. We kissed and held hands. He said I was the most beautiful woman in the world to him. It had been so long since a man had looked at me like that. I did not object and just went with the flow. Eventually, my conscience got the best of me, and I left. The next couple of weeks, Craig would show up at my desk, play pranks on me, and it was usually something stupid like reprogram my keyboard, or once he put up police tape all over my desk because I had borrowed his hole punch and not returned it, so it looked like a crime scene. It was so funny and cute. I did stuff to him, too. Me being Mexican, showed him a casserole egg, and when he asked me, what do you do with that thing, I told him, Come here and I'll show you. I then smashed it on his head. Boy, did I pay for that one. Okay, Craig calls me again and says the gang was getting together again that night and asked if I wanted to join them. I was going to the gym that night and would be all sweaty, so I told them no, maybe some other time. 
He kept asking, and I finally gave in. After the gym, I went to the bar to meet up with the gang. When I got there, I found out that me and him were the only ones there. I asked him, where is everyone else? I knew if I told you that it would only be me and you, you would not come, so I just lied to you. I was a little upset about it, but not enough to think twice as to why he had set it up like this. I still had the crush on him after all. So he played pool, stayed there quite late. After many drinks, I was way too drunk to drive. He lived down the road, and I lived like 20 to 25 minutes away. He said, come to my house so that we can sober up with some coffee. I agreed. I followed him. Now I know what some of you were thinking. This was stupid. But I'd known him at this point for like 10 years, and he'd never done anything to me except humiliate me twice, or maybe three times at a bar. Inside his apartment, he started a pot of coffee, and then he put some music on. I sat on the couch and started to fall asleep. He sat next to me and began to kiss me. Things went so fast from there, and he was eventually on top of me, trying to take off my shirt. He got my shirt off, but not my bra. So he pushed that up and began to bite me, everywhere. And he went wild and began to tug at my jeans, but I kept telling him no. He was so drunk, when he finally got my jeans off, he forgot that I had panties, so he's never able to penetrate me, but he did try. The entire time I was in shock. I couldn't believe my friend of 10 years would try to rape me. I finally got in a position where I was able to push him off of me with my legs. And once I was free, I grabbed my clothing and purse, then ran out of there. I was caught off guard and ran after me. I was crying the whole time. I ran to the elevator naked, putting on my clothes as I was in the elevator. He leaped into the elevator entrance and asked me, What's wrong? I was crying and stayed in the corner of the elevator and told him, Let me go, Craig, please. He backed away from the elevator and said, Okay, I won't hurt you. Then the door closed. When I got home, my humiliation was complete. I came in crying, and my husband Jay saw me. He was upset, but not mad. He was very logical about it, said he wanted me to report it to the police. I knew what would happen. They would ask why I was in his apartment. And I just couldn't go through that, so I did nothing. I called in sick for three days. I had bite marks all of my neck on my, my breasts, my legs, my stomach. I had bruises on my arms and inner thighs. I knew eventually I would have to go back to work. I covered the marks that were visible with makeup, but still it was humiliating to have to come in at all. I hung the shame of it all every day I came in after that incident for a couple of weeks. The first day at work, I should mention he sat on the other side of the partition from me. I was in a high state of panic and anxiety. He shows up at my cubicle worried. He asked me, I thought you were deadly sick or something. I'm glad you are back. Can we talk in private? I turned my back on him and told him that I wasn't up to that just yet. It went like this for about three to four months. He finally corners me one time in the bathroom, and he's making a scene in front of other employees, says, Do you want me not to bother you then? I tell him yes, don't bother me. During this break, I had to travel for my job for three months, and he traveled too, maybe about three to four months for his job. During the travel period, I moved out of the apartment I had with my husband and asked him for the divorce. I bought a new vehicle, I let Jay keep the old car and any furnishings that he wanted. I needed the break to clear my head. I called around during that time, found a roommate who lived in Maryland. When I came back, Craig was still on travel, and his travel was extended for another three or four months, and I don't let grass grow under my feet. I started a date again, found a guy who I liked, and began a serious relationship with Nathan. Craig came back. He was real angry. He knew that me and my husband had filed for divorce, but I had started seeing another man. He called me at home one time and asked me, Why are you doing this to us? I pretended like I didn't know what he was talking about. I told him, There is no us. He got real sad said, What do you want me to do then? I told him, Just date other people. He asked me, Will this make you happy? I replied, Yes. I introduced him to a friend of Nathan's. She was cute, but a handful. She calls me up one day to tell me that he is moving in with her to Maryland. I was glad, but it didn't make any sense. He hated Maryland. 
called me later that night and said, okay, I have a girlfriend. Now what? I didn't understand him. I don't know, Craig. Get to know her better. Move on. He told me, Kayla, I have to talk to you. I didn't know what happened that night. I would just get panicky and tell him no. Almost daily he would call me to complain about Patsy and say that he wanted to see me again. I would not tell him where I lived, but he eventually got my apartment phone number and would call that if he couldn't contact me via cell phone. Him and my friend dated, and then I would get calls from her and him about the relationship not working. So I was the mediator. She would call me to tell me that he was being a total jerk, and he would call me to tell me that he missed me and didn't like Patsy. I kept telling them to keep trying. I finally got a call from her. She is crying, saying that Craig was leaving her. He was moving out, and she couldn't stop him. They had only been together like two or three months. I called up Craig and asked him what was going on. He told me that she's crazy. I can't live with her, not even for you. I'm done. I was mad at him. Craig, you promised to try this time. He said, why can't we be like it was? I would never let him finish, and he said, I need to talk to you, Kayla, please. Some time passes, maybe like three months or so. Patsy's still upset about Craig. She asked me to call him up and find out if we can all meet up at a bar in Virginia, where he was living yet again. I called him up. He says, are you coming too? I said, yes, of course. He continued, I'll do it if you promise me you will talk to me about that night. I agreed, but I told him, but you need to promise me that you will be nice to Patsy and show her a good time. He promised me. I stood up at this bar. I came in with Nathan in tow, and Craig was pissed off about that. He showed it by saying, you didn't tell me that you were bringing him. I said, well, you never asked. So we all sat there in silence. After about 30 minutes, Craig pulls on my arm and says, you promised me a talk. I tugged my hand back and said, you promised me you would be charming. And suddenly he was the most charming guy in the room. He had everyone laughing, and it was just a hoot. About 30 minutes go by. He tugs on my hand and says, okay, I kept my side of the bargain. Now let's have that talk. I told everyone that we would be back. We went outside, and as soon as he had me alone outside, he had me pinned to the wall with both hands on either side of my head. He says, you owe me an explanation of the day that you ran out on me. Him talking to me so close to me brought all the pain and humiliation back to me. I said, Craig, you know what happened. I said, Kayla, you know how I feel about you. I told him, stop it. You know I'm still married. You know I told you that I was trying to save my marriage. When I came home that night after seeing you, Jay saw all those bite marks and bruises on me, and he wanted me to call the police on you. I wouldn't do it because I felt loyalty towards you, and I couldn't believe that you had done that to me. He leaned into me. What did I do? I began to cry and said, You tried to rape me. He was truly shocked and said, No, I would never hurt you. I love you. I have loved you for so very long. Everyone we hung out with knew that I loved you, but I knew you were married, so I waited. And then I heard from your roommate that you and Jay had talked about splitting up. I thought that your marriage was over. I told him... It could have been so different if you hadn't done that. Now I can't let my guard down with you. I can't trust you. You become this mean, spiteful person when you drink. I began to cry. But I love you so much. I told him I can't love you because I can't trust you. After this conversation, he left. Three months after that, he moved to a different agency. And six months after that, I heard he got married, and then he moved to England. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and hit the bell for notifications on future videos and become a stalker of the night, and I'll see you next time.